All right, so our second type of double displacement reactions are acid-base reactions. And we probably remember from nomenclature, an acid starts with H in front. Um, base always means, at least for intro and Chem 1, hydroxide. We'll get into other different types of acids and bases in Chem 2 and then organic. Um, but for now, we're looking at H and OH. And what we can always predict is that we make HOH, which of course we know is water. And a lot of times with these reactions, visually there's not really any indication of a chemical change, right? A lot of acids are colorless solutions, a lot of bases are colorless solutions. And of course you make water, which is a colorless solution. But a lot of times the acid-base reactions will be exothermic. We remember that. It means that there will be some heat production. But if the acid and base are dilute, then you really won't even feel that because the water will absorb all the energy. You have six strong acids. These are always good to know. The halogens, except for fluoride, so hydrochloric, hydrobromic, hydroiodic acid, those are all very strong. HF is not, it's actually a weak acid comparatively. And then when it comes to the oxyanions, the more terminal oxygens, the stronger it will be. So nitric acid is stronger than nitrous, sulfuric stronger than sulfurous, and perchloric is stronger than chloric or chlorous acid. So these six right here are your six strong acids. And what that means is they 100% dissociate. So they would be strong ions in like very strong electrolytic solutions, very strong acids. So that's the first part, those are our acids. For your base, we said we were talking about hydroxides, all right? So the general formula here is you have an acid, I just marked it as A with the H in front, base for B for base with the hydroxide, and the hydrogen from the acid combines with the hydroxide from the base to make water, and then some kind of salt would be left here, ionic compound, right? The B and the A would come together to make some kind of ionic compound. Now, acid-base reactions, we can balance these just like we did double displacement, but there is a little bit of a shortcut, I think. Um, the number of hydrogens that you have in the acid has to equal the number of hydroxides that you have in the base, and that will equal the number of waters that you make. Um, and that is because for every one hydrogen, you need one hydroxide to make one water. So an example here, it says we've got calcium hydroxide, which would be calcium plus two hydroxide minus one, so CaOH2, neutralizes, just means it's an acid-base reaction, hydrochloric acid, all right? And we wanna know the balanced equation. Now, hydroxides are generally soluble. However, um, the group two alkaline earth metals like calcium, are only slightly soluble. So they don't dissolve that well. Like if you're familiar with milk and magnesia, that's magnesium hydroxide. So you know that's not fully soluble. <laughs> you can see the white precipitate. So I'm actually going to um, mark this as a solid because the group two alkaline earth metals are typically not very soluble when, it, when they're combined with hydroxide. Now that's not gonna change how we predict this reaction. In terms of the products, we know since it's acid-base, we're always gonna make water, and then we're gonna have some kind of salt. And in this case, the cation would be the calcium, which is plus two, and it would partner with the chloride, which is minus one. So if we do this the double displacement way, we would look at our ions. We've got calcium plus two and hydroxide. And then in the HCl, we've got hydrogen plus one and the chloride minus one. When I put the hydrogen and hydroxide together, I get water. When I put calcium and chloride together, I should get CaCl2, just to balance out those charges. The other way you could do this though, what I think of as the shortcut way, is to look at this sort of formula here. I have one hydrogen in the acid, I've got two hydroxides in the base. I wanna first make that equal. So since I have two hydroxides, I'm gonna put a two in front of HCl. Now I have two hydrogens, two hydroxides, so two waters will be made. And what's nice is when the hydrogen and hydroxide are balanced, by default, whatever's left will also be balanced. So one calcium, two chlorines are left, and that's what we predict, calcium chloride CaCl2. 
The water always gets marked L for liquid. And then the ionic compound, the salt, is typically going to be aqueous, right? But our solubility rules would tell us that that is indeed aqueous. Now, for the ionic equation, what we saw with the previous video is just anything aqueous breaks up into ions. And solids don't, they stay together. And liquids also don't, they, they stay together. So what we would have here is the calcium hydroxide would stay together as a solid. The hydrochloric acid would break up because it's aqueous. So the hydrogen ions and the chloride ions would break apart. And we know strong acids 100% do that. The, there would be two of each of those from the balanced equation because of that coefficient in front. On the product side, the waters, right, those stay together because it's a liquid, not aqueous. And then on the product side, the calcium and the two chlorides would break apart because they're aqueous. All right, so in terms of spectator ions, when I go to simplify this for my net ionic equation, the only ion that will cancel out is the chloride. So the calcium hydroxide solid, that would still be there in the net ionic equation combining with the two hydrogen ions. On the product side, we would form two waters and the calcium ion would then be dissolved in solution. <clears throat> so that net ionic equation, we simplified it, but we could only simplify it by taking out the chloride spectator ion. Everything else showed a change. So when you go to write ionic equations, just make sure you remember solids always stay together and pure liquids always stay together, all right? Now for titration, titration is a fun experiment. You probably remember doing this in, in intro where we have two burettes and I'm gonna draw some pretty rough pictures right here. Um, and you have one for the acid and one for the base. <clears throat> and I'll just mark this acid and base. And you start your experiment with your Erlenmeyer flask and you take some sample of acid into your flask. So I'll just say A for acid. Then you bring it over in front of your, um, or underneath your base burette, and you titrate the acid with base. And what happens is as the acid and base titrate together, you make water. So as you're adding base, the acid is being consumed, right? It's being turned into water. At some point, um, with the help of a pH indicator, um, your pH is going to change because you're going to run out of acid and the next drop of base will react with that pH indicator to change the color. And so we use titration to determine the concentration of the unknown. It doesn't have to be the acid, it could be the base, um, but in lab what we did for intro is we were determining the concentration of the acid. All right. So on the next page we've got an example of this, this type of experiment says we have a 25 milliliter sample of hydrobromic acid solution with an unknown molarity and it's titrated with 37.51 milliliters of a 0.0158 molar magnesium hydroxide solution. What would be the molarity of the HBr? So one thing I want to say first before we, we do this uh, problem. A lot of times students want to use the M1V1 equals M2V2 formula here because it looks like it should work. I've got a molarity and a volume, a volume, and I want a molarity, right? So that looks like it should work. But remember when we talked about this, this was only for dilution. And this isn't dilution. We have a chemical reaction taking place here. So we, we can't use that formula here. What we do need first, however, is the balanced chemical equation. So we've got the hydrobromic react, or sorry, hydrobromic acid uh, in solution, we know it's a solution. Number one, it says so, but it's a volume, right? And unknown molarity. Molarity we only put with aqueous, so it's a solution. Combining with magnesium hydroxide. And this one, it is saying it's a solution. It's very dilute though, so that's why it doesn't have to be a solid precipitate. Um, and then on the product side, we know we're gonna make water and then something with magnesium and bromide. So when I go to look at this, there are two hydroxides in the base. So I'm gonna make sure that I have two hydrogens from the acid and I'm gonna make two waters on the product side. And then with my magnesium bromide, I'm gonna have two bromines balancing out the magnesium. So I've got my balanced equation. 
I'm looking for the molarity of HBr. So that's gonna be my B where I'm headed. So I'm gonna to have to start with my magnesium hydroxide. So first thing I'm gonna do is say, okay, I had 37.51 milliliters of magnesium hydroxide. And the molarity of that was 0 0.01580 moles per liter or per thousand milliliters. And so that right there would tell me how many moles of magnesium hydroxide I had in this reaction. Then what I always do in the middle is my multiple ratio. For every one mole of magnesium hydroxide, I reacted that with two moles of HBr. But I have to stop here, at least I like stopping here, I'll show you why. So I'm gonna take my volume times the molarity, divide by 1,000, times that molar coefficient of two, and I get 0 0.001185 moles of HBr. All right, and I kept four significant figures. Now, if I'm trying to solve for the molarity of the HBr, what we talked about in our very first video for the chapter is that for molarity, you have to have the moles divided by the liters. That's the formula. So I just figured out, based on the amount of magnesium hydroxide I used, and my multiple ratio, I know that I used or consumed 0 0.001185 moles of HBr. And I know that that many moles of HBr came from that 25.00 milliliter sample. The only problem here is that that's moles per milliliter, so I need to quick change milliliters to liters. All right, and so what I'll do is I'll take the 0 0.001185 divided by 25, then times 1,000, and I get a molarity here of 0 0.04741 for the concentration of that hydrobromic acid solution. All right, so that's how you do titration problems. You have to start with your known, where you know the volume, you know the molarity. Volume times molarity gets you to moles and then include the mole ratio to get to moles of your unknown. Then to get molarity of the unknown, take that number of moles, divide it by the volume of the sample used, just making sure that volume term is in liters, and that'll get you your concentration. All right, last thing for this video, um, there are some acid-base reactions that will actually generate gas. Um, carbonates are one, you're probably familiar with that. If you have baking soda and vinegar, the carbonate releases carbon dioxide. Um, sulfide is another one. If it turns into H2S, you might be familiar with that, like the rotten egg smell, hydrogen sulfide and H2S, that will produce a gas. And then like the carbonate, the sulfite will also produce gas, SO2 instead of CO2. And then ammonia is the other one, right? If I have ammonium with hydroxide, that turns into water and ammonia. So these are all sort of just sort of special examples of reactions that will produce a gas. Um, technically, they're all still under the umbrella of double displacement reactions. We don't have like ion change or anything. We're just looking at um, some of these specifically forming gases um, instead of precipitates. So for these, like with this, the baking soda and hydrochloric acid, it's the bubbling that would make you know that you have a chemical change. All right, so those are just sort of special types of reactions to be aware of with carbonates, sulfide in an acidic solution, sulfite, and then ammonium hydroxide, which is um, ammonia. That's a good place for me to stop for this video.